Hello everyone, welcome to the Scorn Somewhat Classical Music Improvisation Channel. This video is part of a series of interviews with all classical musicians doing anything with improvisation um, to show how much it is already part of our scene right now. You can find the other interviews through the link above. Um, and of course, I would love to invite you to uh, tell us if we should interview you or if you know other people that we should interview as well. My next guest improvises on the piano in many styles and has been teaching improvisation at several institutions in the world. Um, Karst Jung, feel free to share the interview if you like it uh, and let us know your thoughts. Hello Karst, thank you so much for uh, wanting to talk to us. I was wondering how does improvisation play a role in your musical life? <laughs> well, first of all, hello uh, Robert, thanks very much for having me for the interview. Um, and that's, uh, that's quite a question. How does it play a role? Um, I, I should answer actually that it always was present in my musical life. Um, and it started uh, being a, a young child and we used to have a pianola. And uh, as soon as I could, I was, you know, like um, <laughs> working the pedals and the, the things. And especially my favorites were the Chopin rolls. But I would, I remember I would just like, you know, start banging along with it, you know, which probably would have been a very, um, very bad thing, but uh, I had no idea. I mean, so from being very young, I remember just, you know, very much enjoying sound, very much enjoying music, but also feeling, you know, the need to, to just do whatever I wanted to do. Yeah. And that, that evol evolved, if I could maybe go on a little bit, that evolved um, when I had my first play piano lessons, of course I had to do what was in the book and I had to learn how to put my fingers and everything. But um, after two years we moved to another city quite far away from the other one in our country and uh, for one and a half year I had no piano lessons. And those one and a half years were actually very, very important for me. Because I started to, yeah, well, then, okay, I started to invent my own stuff. And I started to play along with the radio and uh, the rules, kind of stuff that I liked. And uh, so I think that those one and a half years were actually, in a sense, a blessing for me that I could, yeah, develop my own agency, develop my own ideas. And I was not so worried about having to, you know, um, adhere to the score or to, to do something exactly as it was supposed to be done. Yeah. And at this moment in, in your life, how, how, well, what do you do with improvisation? Yeah, I mean, it has been an integrated way of my musical life and actually it has been a, a process going over decades to discover actually that for me that was really an important thing. And uh, summarizing, you could say that the, the first decade where I was uh, a classical piano student of course, I was I was playing the scores, and, and and even my teacher said, okay, improvisation, it's not a bad thing, but please don't do it on stage, you know, just do this at home for yourself, and then gradually developing that no, maybe this is something that I have to do on stage, and maybe I should I should sort of change my um, expectation of what it is to be a musician, um, and so in the, I could say in the second decade I really developed a kind of concert practice mainly. Uh, focused on the piano, uh, and I and I felt yeah I can improvise on the stage, and it's actually a useful way also to get into a dialogue with the composers and to get into a dialogue with the, all the musics that are around you, and um, then I should say the third stage, the third decade, roughly I discovered I could improvise with others, and I I discovered actually the social importance of improvisation and the. The, the power of improvisation also to connect with other musicians, not by all looking at the same conductor and let him tell you when to start and how fast to play, but actually to negotiate this in real time together. And uh, the kind of joy that you obviously see in other uh, musical cultures and practices, uh, like for example jazz, this kind of joy is something that you know once you discover it, you cannot let that go. Yeah. Um, and we are here in the conservatory and you teach many, many things. Um, how, how does improvisation play a role in your teaching? Um, it has become gradually more and more important. Because I started out simply to earn money. Uh, I started out as a ballet pianist on the one hand, on the other hand as a music theory teacher. 
And obviously, again, in the first dec uh, decade, I tried to be a good theory teacher and just teach what had to be taught and etc. Cetera, et cetera. Um, but there again, um, going together with my, my discovery of this power of improvisation, I felt that improvisation could also be a catalyst actually of learning music theory. So that's roughly a second part of my, my uh, teaching career that I really have developed, I think, uh, to see that, yeah, improvisation is something that, where you really can make the musical concepts your own. So instead of the theoretical idea of what kind of interval is this, how does that interval sound, where do I find it on, on my instrument, and what can I do with it? And, and, and that is like, again, so universal, that goes for harmony, for counterpoint, it goes for all these principles. So actually I would say my theory teaching has been very much enriched by gradually bringing in the improvisation. And then uh, concerning this school, an important thing has been that roughly eight years ago we started to revamp the curriculum for the music theory. And I proposed very strongly, not just me, but also my colleague Bert Moma and some, some others proposed very strongly that maybe the, the old-fashioned way of doing solfege, we should really go into active playing with ensembles and we should try and get this oral development going in connection with the instrument. And that is um, a journey that is not far from over actually. I mean, we've gone in that direction, we've stumbled upon certain problems there, but also uh, huge advantages for learning that way. So yeah, I would say it's all over the place. Yeah. I, I could maybe say I've squeezed myself out of the traditional way of theory teaching and found areas where I could develop um, teaching that, that incorporates improvisation. Yeah. And you were also a motor behind several uh, international projects mm. at the school concerning improvisation. Can you tell us a little bit about Yeah. Those? Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, I have to maybe say a little bit more precisely that uh, around 2010, it felt that the air was there, that the air was clearing, that there was more awareness of improvisation. And um, I have to go back even further, six, seven years before that, um, is the moment that I accepted the position in Barcelona, in the Escola Superior de Musica de Catalunya. And I have to give that school the credit that it was one of the first schools in Europe to actually incorporate improvisation into the curriculum, obligatory for four semesters for each classical musician. And I'm really talking here about classical musicians. So working there had given me seven, eight years of experience working with mixed ensembles, working with all kinds of instrumentalists, with singers, all kinds of levels and actually finding out um, how the teaching of improvisation can be really beneficial for uh, a musician's development. And that, um, I, I, I sort of so much wanted to share that knowledge and share that experience that finally in 2010 I found a good ear here with the management um, to, to maybe get something going. Uh, and um, that idea was, and we have here um, uh, Martin Pagal, our vice uh, dean, who is very, very keen on international relations and on European projects. And he proposed, maybe we can make a European project of improvisation to, um, to stimulate the use of improvisation at higher music education. Um, and indeed, we, we managed to get money for this and to start a, a so-called intensive project uh, in the Royal Conservatoire. And that was an absolutely wonderful experience because we immediately got responses from at least, if I remember well, 10, 11 institutions, and not just any institution, but the, the Conservatoire National de Paris and the Sibelius Academy and Oslo and uh, Barcelona also, actually. Uh, so, so you name it, Guildhall uh, School of Music and Drama. So, so really key players in the European field. And they came all to The Hague and we discussed, you know, improvisation pedagogy and we did workshops with students and we got to know each other as teachers and that was the beginning of a very very fruitful uh, period of uh, collaboration that still goes on today um, yeah and, and and that resulted I could say the peak of that was um, the last phase which was from 2016 to 2018 and it was called metric 
and I don't even know what it stands for, but it's, it's, it's like um, modernizing education through improvisation, something like that. Um, uh, but that metric group has grown to a group of uh, 16 institutions and includes now also Vienna and um, Tallinn and, and, and really some places where interesting things are happening. And it's our way of, of keeping uh, in touch about what happens on the international scene, but also to have um, initiatives where we develop things together. Now, I, I should mention in this case that within that metric group we have a couple of subgroups of schools who are organizing joint European modules. And this means that there is a module that lives in different institutions and that either students are traveling to those institutions or teachers are traveling. And we have one of those modules which I particularly like. It's a module that is more directed towards um, the, the traditional improvisation. And it's called From Score to Creation. And in this module we try to um, have uh, groups develop improvisations on the basis of repertoire. And the three schools involved are Guildhall School of Music and Drama, uh, the Hague Royal Conservatoire and Antwerp Royal Conservatoire. And so it's really interesting, we are traveling as teachers, so we are actually doing guest lessons with students from the other schools. And then we share the results by putting things on video and um, actually grading each other's students also in a sense. So that's quite a, a tight uh, collaboration, yeah, and I think it's a wonderful uh, initiative. Yeah. And, and do you see that in these last years there's also change in the students and how they start approaching well, maybe in their careers or, or music because of these things that they yeah. I, I think I really do see that change, especially in schools that um, make improvisation seem like a normal thing. <laughs> like Barcelona, for example. In Barcelona, every student, okay, you have to do it. So they go in these improvisation classes, they, they spend two years, uh, four semesters in these classes, and they come out like, yeah, okay, this is one of the things we do as musicians. They're not even questioning this whole thing. And I, I find that very, very hopeful. But then there are other schools um, yeah, where, where this, this development goes very, very, very slowly. And um, I think it depends also on what chances you give the students to actually express themselves through improvisation and also through something that I would call um, collaborative music creation. Because mm. that's a little bit something that I'm developing myself into now, that it's not for me just about the improvisation, but it's also about the agency, about the, the ownership of your materials. You know, are you just playing the music of another composer or is that something that you can really recreate, so to say? So in these collaborative um, creative projects, um, I, I really try to see what comes out of the students mm. and um, how can we connect that to the repertoire that they're playing, how can we connect that to their, their overall musical development. And those are very exciting questions. Yeah. Um, and did you did you have an improvisation teacher yourself? No. 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 Just th th those yeah. three times. Yeah. To be honest, no. I never had an improvisation teacher. I had many inspirations, uh, I should say. Um, so of course, people who you know, you know, so, and they came a lot. I actually out of the jazz world. So. If I have to name, of course, Chikoria and uh, Keith Jarrett and uh, Brett Maildow and you know all of them, because I realized very soon those are people who are playing their own notes. But it's not that that it's that it's strange music. It's connected in all ways to all different ways to the music that already exists. But they sound like themselves. Mm. So you can play me three seconds of Brett Maildow, and I can tell you that's Brett Maildow. Yeah. Play me three seconds of a world famous pianist playing a Beethoven sonata, I have no idea. I hear Beethoven, but I don't hear that artist. Well, no, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but you, you see, that, that is a little bit, that really made me think like, like, what is it about if you become a musician? Huh? If you really always are in service of what somebody else made up what somebody else, uh, even even curation, you know, even like, like if you just let yourself always being told like, okay, we're going to be playing here and you're going to be sitting there and you're wearing those clothes and, and this are your, are your notes and there's your conductor and here's your metronome. I mean, that then 
I think you maneuver yourself in a, in a difficult position. So I'm not really sure if we need more of those kind of musicians in the future. <laughs> and um, you mentioned this sort of uh, personal style of, of these musicians yeah. that you uh, were inspired by. Yeah. How, how did you work on, it, on that yourself? Is there a way to, to practice that? Yeah. I mean, that sounds a little bit silly, but... You know, this is a really interesting question. Because I think if you just, um, per, if you, if you, how do you say, if you persist actually, if you make it your practice of improvising, I think this personal style will emerge. It's not something that you're putting on, it's just more something you're uncovering actually. And it might not be the most interesting one. I mean, we, we're not all bread mailed out, I know that. So it's also a kind of acceptance of, of who you are. But on the other hand, uh, this question I got asked more often, like what can you practice about improvisation? And there again, uh, through, through, throughout the years, I have learned that you cannot practice improvisation by just improvising all the time. Because it, there is a difference between just letting come out whatever you, you know, whatever comes out and actually focusing on aspects of music. And in that focusing, I think there's a lot of practice uh, opportunity. So um, I, I do this sometimes by just realizing, hey, this composer, for example, Chopin, they has a certain way of ornamentation, of making his ornamentation. How does that work? Can I maybe just, you know, only focus on that and try, uh, huh? if you have, um, uh, for example, if Chopin makes a, a C major chord, you know, he doesn't just make a chord, but he goes, that's above the, the chord tone and then you can really you can start to just develop kind of little exercises that would would do that right uh, or make melodies that always end on the on the note above instead of the note uh, where you want to go and so if you have something like that, uh, instead of a... Uh, no, yeah, you see? So you, you, you can actually like really um, focus on, on certain aspects of the music. And you might say theory, um, again, I don't know if it's theory, but yeah, it, there are a lot of things like how does music work? How do you get a certain expressive effect? And if you focus on that, and if you just practice for a while just with that, um, then it will go at some point in your subconscious, and then you improvise. Oh, it comes out. Yeah, of course it comes out, because you put it in somewhere. See? So I believe in that, that you can kind of build up your vocabulary by focusing on certain things, focusing on certain exotic scales, or it can be anything, of the tonic scales, modes of melodic minor, pentatonics, um, Indonesian scales, whatever. I mean, there's so much out there, and you can just play around and focus yourself on this restriction, and that makes you, I think, a better improviser, yeah. Yeah, yeah this is very fascinating. So, because I've heard you play or improvise in many different <laughs> styles, yeah. and yeah. so, uh, and well, it's obvious in a way how you how you have practiced those mm -hmm. things, but as you said, at a, at some point it becomes a sort of subconscious thing. So yeah. then, when you are improvising in that kind of style, how how conscious are you of using specific materials, or is, is this still also a subconscious? Process? You mean while I'm improvising? Whilst improvising? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, well, de definitely, because while I improvise, I do observe myself. So there is this layer, there is this layer, let's say, of automatic uh, generation of your improvisation, but there's also the layer of yourself hearing that and observing that, and sometimes um, acting on it, sometimes, you know, like turning the steering wheel a little bit. So yes, I, I, I am usually aware, yeah. And, and do, you, do you feel that there's, um, in that balance between those things, is there also a sort of, now, how should I ask it? Might you, by accident, so to speak, also stop your creative flow by becoming too an analytical? Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. 
Yeah, that's always a, a, a great danger. Yeah, this is also a source of discussion that I have often with students who in the beginning are struggling because they are thinking so much that they cannot play. <laughs> and we, we just know at some point that thinking and playing is, is uh, their enemies in a sense <laughs> of each other. On the other hand, if you just play without any kind of thinking, so how do you do that? See, see? So I developed also during the years, I developed many ex exercises that actually address this multitasking. Um, for example, one thing that I find really interesting, especially with beginning, is uh, to make real-time canons. So there's one leader, there's one follower, uh, and the leader is, uh, is, is one bar ahead and the follower is one bar, bar later. Then if you analyze what actually happens in such a situation, uh, is that uh, you have to play what the leader played a bar ago, but in the meantime, he's playing something else. So you have to play something without stopping, listening to something else at the same time, taking that in and thinking how you organize that. Uh, so there, I mean, there are so many things going on at the same time. But actually, that is also a kind of practice, because if you do that a lot, then you can also learn to not stop your fingers or not stop your musical movement, but at the same time, be a little bit uh, overseeing what is going on. Yeah. And um, when it comes to free or free improvisation, um, do the same things apply in terms of practice? How do you in terms of, of, so you said before you will look at a particular piece or a particular scale or a particular approach, but if you go into free improvisation, uh, is there a way also to practice that where perhaps there are no scales or no mm. particular... Yeah, you really mean a completely free improvisation. Um, yeah, there are certain, certainly many ways of practicing that. Again, there you can uh, put yourself restrictions. So you can say, I will play beautiful melodies, but I can only use perfect fourths and, and, and major seconds. And can I still feel fluid and I can still move without constantly thinking? Um, and the same thing you can do with completely other things, which is um, challenging yourself to go for certain playing styles or challenging yourself to go from uh, triple pianissimo to quadruple fortissimo in one minute. And so without you know, paying any attention to what kind of note you play, but you want that expression. So you can certainly sort of train your muscles in, in, in many different directions, which are not just about pitch or chords or melodies, but also about yeah, articulation, dynamics, um, use of registers on, on, on the piano. And that goes, of course, for each instrument individually. Each instrument has its own um, world, so to say, and it also has its own playing techniques and its own expressive uh, possibilities. Uh, so yeah, you can, you can to a certain extent do, do that, yeah. What do you think is needed for the future of improvisation for classical musicians? So yeah. not necessarily in a classical style, in any of free or no, exactly. whatever. No, exactly. I think it needs to be accepted as, as an art form, but it will not because we're going to ask everybody to accept it. It will only because we have to be quite proactive to get ourselves programmed and to, to bring interesting ideas out there and to maybe shift also the attention from the idea that you have superior compositions that are being performed Two, that you just have really interesting ideas about what you want to bring to the stage and then it's your uh, responsibility to, to, yeah, to, to give that uh, a form with your improvisational power. So yeah, I, I think there needs to be proactiveness here. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Karst. You're welcome. And I, we hope to see you very soon.